Good afternoon, everyone. Just a quick note that we won't be starting yet for three or four minutes, just to allow everybody enough time to join. Please feel free to introduce yourselves through chat. Um, obviously, everybody will be muted at the moment uh, during the process because of the uh, number of people participating, but please share your questions um, using the chat facility. Um, and we plan to go live in about three minutes time, 3.30. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's with great pleasure to um, uh, welcome you to today's um, webinar um, on the topic of living well with CLL uh, or SLL for want of, of uh, um, a better description to be more inclusive. Um, my name's Nick, many of you will know me. I am also a CLL patient, but I am also the healthcare liaison officer at Leukemia Care. And I'll be co-hosting uh, the event or co-moderating with Stephen Scowcroft of Lymphoma Action. Stephen is the Director of Operations and uh, External Affairs for Lymphoma Action. And I think it's appropriate in CLL that um, we're able to co-host the event as, you know, CLL is known in its leukemic form, um, but also has a uh, a more solid tumor lymphoma form and small lymphocytic lymphoma and uh, you know is is often described as a subgroup of, of lymphoma so it's appropriate that the two organizations are able to come to get, together to, to share resources to help with living well <clears throat> living well with CLL I mean so effectively what we're going to look at is look at health strategies coping strategies um, activities um, around learning and self-activity uh, self self advocacy sorry um to to share the combined experience of a very experienced panel on on what strategies may help us all to live well so the idea really is please share experiences share your questions through chat and um 
what I'd like to be able to do at the moment, if possible, uh, from a house king point of view, is everybody on Zoom and, and, and Facebook, the uh, people will remain muted. So it, it's important if you can, if you can share your questions, we'll try to come to them all if we can. Those on Facebook, please share your questions um, in uh, comments and members of staff will pick them up and share them uh, with Stephen and myself. Um, at this stage, I'll let Stephen come in a little bit later on. I think probably the, the best thing to do first is in an order of events, these, our, our panel of speakers, we have the four speakers, two clinical speakers who you'll know well and two very experience, uh, experienced patients. Um, after everybody, is, the speakers have given their introduction talks and shared their experiences, both from the clinician's point of view on strategies, both health and coping that can help you live well, patients will share their experience and then we'll have a nice relaxed discussion and um, we'll field your questions to the panel. Um, so hopefully we can all share the benefit of each other's experience. So with on that note, I'd like to introduce our first speaker. And our first speaker is the very well known Professor Chris Fagan. Um, Chris, would you like to take uh, take over and uh, introduce yourself? Hello, everyone. I'm Chris Fagan. I'm uh, a just retired NHS consultant and professor of haematology at Cardiff University. Uh, I'm still professor of, in Cardiff University. They've just stopped paying me. Uh, they just give you jobs now without paying you. I'm sure some of you are familiar with that sort of thing. Uh, I've had a lifelong interest in CLL, clinical trials, basic science and patient well-being. Uh, and I've had a big, big practice over the years. And in fact, I kept the record of every single patient uh, and a database of it because CLL is a very heterogeneous disease. And from the clinical point of view, there's many fascinating things about it that we don't know. And that impacts directly on the patients. One of the most difficult things with CLL is actually getting your head in the right place in terms of what it means to you, because it's very, very different. I, in my database of the 1400 patients I ever saw, uh, one of them diagnosed in 1979, passed away in 2013 of an unrelated cause, and it never had any treatment for a CLL whatsoever, and ran a white count of over 100. Other patients had relatively low white counts, 2030, and had a disease which did impact their well-being a lot, lot more, and they needed treatment for it. One of the real problems is actually at the diagnosis and getting the frame of mind right at the very beginning. What's difficult as a clinician, I always used to ask my patients when they first came in, what have you been told? Because 70% of patients are found by chance, and we don't know uh, if the person, it's usually just a full blood count and the lymphocytosis, Sometimes they've gone on and made the diagnosis from that same blood sample, another one, and sometimes they haven't. They've just got a high white count, a high lymphocyte count. So as a clinician, when I meet the patient for the first time, I'm trying to work out myself what you know, what you understand, and what you've read. For those patients who've not been told anything, it's often quite a difficult conversation because the moment you mention the term chronic lymphocytic leukemia, uh, most patients almost glaze over. They almost switch off everything else you say after that. And that's because it's such a shock. You know, chronic implies incurable. Uh, leukemia implies cancer. Uh, so you basically, you're telling them they've got incurable blood cancer. And that very first appointment as a clinician, quite often you're talking to the patient, but you know it's almost... Um, going past them because they've just switched off. They had no idea what was coming. Then you have the other patients who've read an awful lot about it. And that's a mixed blessing as well, because of course we all focus in on the most difficult aspects. We all focus in on the bad things, not the good things, if we pre-read. So what I'm really trying to do at my first visit is make a relationship with the patient, because we're gonna be in this together, uh, possibly forever. You know, 5, 10, 20, 30 years, some of my patients I was with them uh, for. And so getting that relationship correct at the beginning and trusting each other that I as a clinician can trust you, you as a patient can trust me. And that's why honesty is such an important thing, being honest to yourself about it. Very common people 
commonly people ask me, what do I tell my partner or what do I tell work or what do I tell my children? What do I tell my mum and dad? All these things have to be faced. Uh, most people with uh, who are told they've got a condition just want to know about the treatment and when will I be better? But to say 70% of patients present well, they're found by chance and there's nothing actually wrong with them. So that first meeting, what I'm just trying to do is to sow the seeds of an ongoing relationship, try and get the soil right so the seed can grow. And between this, between us, we can get through this together. Sometimes it goes really, really, really well. And I tap myself on the back and say, I'm a bloody wonderful doctor I am. Wasn't that good? And other times, for whatever reason, it just doesn't seem to go right. But it's just the first one. So usually I try and get people back very quickly after the first one because lots of questions will occur to them which they haven't, won't answer because they've slightly glazed over. They will go home, worry about, talk to their family and worry about that. So try and get the second appointment in quickly because what we're trying to do is steady the relationship and build on it going forward. And that's what I mean about getting your head in the right place at the beginning because some of the written literature and online literature isn't really helpful. It's actually slightly misleading, slightly incorrect. And of course, if you're going to live uh, 20 years on watching weight, you don't want to inhibit your life and your well-being and that of your family and restrict your opportunities for happiness by being overzealous with what you do. But then likewise, you've got to try and get the balance right. That should you ever need treatment, that actually you're pretty well and able to face up to it, both physically, emotionally, uh, all these things have to be brought together for a successful outcome, by which I mean is a well patient getting on with the life they would have had if those three words hadn't been spoken to them uh, at that very first appointment. So welcome everyone. You're on mute, Nick. <clears throat> Do it every time. Thank you, Chris, for that introduction. That certainly resonated. I'm not sure if the audience may know this, but um, Chris was my own physician at diagnosis. And I still remember to this day the first time I met Chris whilst I was actually in the process of having a bone marrow <laughs> biopsy, which uh, it, it was Chris's demeanor that certainly settled me. Um, and, and, and I'm sure we've got lots to discuss on these topics about how, how we communicate at, at our first uh, uh, appointments with our, our clinicians and how to make the best of these. So it, it's my greatest pleasure at the moment to introduce Helen Knight. Helen is a uh, CLL specific clinical nurse specialist and works out of Nottingham University's Health uh, Healthcare Trust. Helen, please, please take the floor. Thank you, Nick. Uh, and thank you very much for inviting me. It's a, a pleasure to be asked and to be able to join in with the conversations this afternoon. Um, I've worked in haematology for about the last 20 years now um, in various different roles. But um, eight years ago, I was given the opportunity to start a new role as a CLL nurse specialist. Um, and this was one of the first in the country. And there's still only a handful of us that are just CLL specific. Um, a lot of us are involved in other areas like lymphoma as well. Uh, and cover a larger ground but um, to be able to cover CLL solely has been a real privilege and I've met a lot of lovely lovely people like Nick uh, along the way um, and I met Nick quite early on in my journey really in my career. Um, I think how we treat CLL patients has completely changed over that period of time as well. The landscape has completely changed, treatments have changed, the conversations I have with patients are very different over that period of time. But uh, as Professor Fagan said, that first meeting is the most key part. And as a nurse specialist, I try to be there on, on diagnosis and see them afterwards. So they've had that information and to be able to back that up for them to catch their breath a bit afterwards and then go through what they've heard, um, check what their understanding is, uh, give written information to back that up if they want it. But I think there's no right or wrong way of how what patients want and what support they want. And it's trying to time that right for everybody. So there's no set routine. There's no set thing. It's very much uh, on an individual basis of what patients want and when they want it and to drip feed that if they want it or if they want everything at once to come back to it. 
Um, and I think as nurse specialists, that's what we're there for, really. We're there to be that support mechanism for them as and when they need it. It's um, our key point would be then to be that point of contact as well, really. So sometimes that appointment straight afterwards could be quite a long time. I know in, in Nottingham, it can be three to four months after we see them that first time. And it's a long, long time for people to process a lot of information. They get a lot of questions over that time. So as nurse specialists or key workers, whatever you want to call us really, we're there as that point of contact to offer that support. We're there to signpost, so that supportive care means a great deal really I think on I was asked to talk about supportive care and actually it's really really broad and it's whatever you want to make it really of what we can offer you I think as nurse specialists we want to try and solve everything for you we want to be able to fix all the problems that you've got and we can't always do that but our, our main goal is to try and help people as much, much as we can um, and I wrote a list of just what sort of things we add so it will be signposting to other information it could be helping with financial problems, work problems, maybe work haven't been that supportive to try and help that. It could be things like vaccinations. So at the moment, it's another new, new scenario that we're in is to, as a, can I get the vaccination? Is it safe for me to have? When do I have it? If you're on treatment, can I have it? How well will it work? So lots of other support that's needed that we're all learning at the same time as well, really, um, with all the guidelines that are changing constantly. So I think in, in my role as, as, as support, really, we're there for the patient from the beginning. We try and make a good relationship because I think the better the relationship is, we want to empower people to be able to ask when they want to ask, really, not feel they've got to wait or feel scared to ask. I always say there's no thing as a, such thing as a silly question. You ask it, it's fine. It's not daft at all. It's probably been asked before just to ask it when you feel you want to and that there's always somebody there to talk to. So you've not got to wait to speak you can talk to us whenever you want to speak and that the support is constantly there especially during covid a lot of people were scared we weren't there anymore but we are we're still there as much as we possibly can um, doing the same job at the same level to provide the best care we possibly can so that's my brief overview <laughs> of support really. thank you helen that that's um really really helpful and i think that's an area we'd like to explore really is uh, you know in, in questions following the talks is um you know how how to best communicate and how to find those people in our care team that we can um communicate with on, the, on a one-to-one -one basis um which is often a big challenge for cll patients lots to explore um it's my great pleasure now to introduce the first of our uh, patient panel um, one of our greatest CLL veterans, for want of a better word, um, and a fantastic living well with CLL champion. Um, I'd like to introduce a friend and colleague, uh, John Greensmith. John, please take the floor and uh, please share your experience in CLL and strategies that have helped you uh, navigate, uh, you know, different parts of your uh, very experienced um, journey. Uh, thanks, Nick, and I hope I can uh, fulfil that very... <laughs> flowery introduction. Uh, yes, well, uh, to, to give that context, I was diagnosed in 1990. I was a living, breathing, working North Sea diver. And as part of an annual diving medical, it showed an abnormality in a blood count, which on further investigation revealed uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And later on, a couple of years later, was, was uh, reclassified as CLL. Uh, I've had a huge number of treatments over that 30 year period. And last March, I transitioned from ibrutinib, which I'd been on for five and a half years, onto venetoclax, yes, during lockdown, which was a bit of a challenge. The last place I really, my head wanted me to go to was hospital, but it actually was brilliant. It was great. It was really reassuring. And, um, I, I would also echo what both uh, uh, Professor Fagan and Helen said with regard to the relationship with the consultant, the uh, trust is key. I've had two significant consultants in, in, in my time, currently with Dominic Culligan, and, um, and uh, de definitely it is a one-to-one -one relationship. Uh, trust is earned on both sides and uh, it, it, it can really benefit and, and bringing a family friend, uh, a wife in, in my case, who very luckily for me also happened to be a, a nurse 
and was brilliant as a sounding board. She absorbed much more of the information than I did at any of the major consultations and was able to then articulate the, the specific points and the bits that I missed because I only heard the headline bits. Uh, what, what was brilliant uh, in terms of interaction with CNS, then our RA hematology nurse, uh, for obvious reasons, you get more time with uh, a, a CNS or, or, or a hematology nurse when you're going through chemo. Uh, they're there, uh, they're, the stuff has been dripped into you and the information can also, to use your phrase, Helen, be, be drip fed to you. Uh, and it's also a time when you can, you have the time to ask questions. Uh, I, I found learning was very important. When I was diagnosed, there wasn't the internet, so a few badly photocopied pieces of paper suffice for me, but nowadays it's huge. I would be very careful to say to folk that they need to look for responsible sources of information. And the level of information you can have is, is very personal. You just need, in my view, you just need to know enough to know enough. Uh, because otherwise you, you'll try to become the Wikipedia and try to compete with the, the, the medical terminology and it, it's, it's impossible. Um, I found very useful the support groups that were available. Maggie's, uh, I, I, in, uh, luckily enough we have one in, in Aberdeen. Uh, I go to a monthly support group there. It is really good, great fun, really good fun and uh, uh, and, and I find that great benefit. In terms of communicating with friends and family, uh, within even the family environment, not everybody wants to know the full detail of what you're, you're going through. And, and that's fine. Uh, they have their own protective uh, environments to work with then. Um, and in terms of work colleagues, um, some people, when I was working, I'm not no longer working, uh, they, they immediately wanted to find out how you were really sympathetic with your situation and then immediately started to tell you about somebody who they knew has cancer. And at times I found that okay because they were genuine, you know, ability or, or empathy to reach out to you. But at times it was kind of burdening me with their issues and, you know, cripes, I have enough to deal with at this particular moment in time. So, you know, you need to be uh, polite, but at the same time, repel borders, to, to use a phrase. Um, sometimes if it was just passing in the corridor and people would say, how are you? I had a very simple stock phrase, which was pink and breathing. And as long as I was pink and breathing, things were going fine. Um, one of the uh, bullet points in, in preparing this was to talk about well-being and exercise. Uh, after I had a severe hemolysis in 2014 and had been on steroids and uh, multiple blood transfusions, uh, I then got to the stage where I just sort of come out of that dark period just before I went on to ibrutinib and the CNS uh, in the ward at the time, I said to him, look, what can I do to improve my situation? And he knew that I'd been fairly active beforehand, but had stopped all exercise for about three years. And he suggested Macmillan move more. So I went to, joined up the local Macmillan move more. It is a reintroduction to exercise, low impact, very protective. And I found that really good. It, it enabled me to get back into activity in a very protected way. And uh, I then refound my, my appetite to get back on a, on a bicycle and just get out. And both the physical benefit of that and, and also much more importantly, the mental benefit of that I found huge. Uh, it was my time on a bike. I could get out in the, the beautiful countryside. I could shout at cattle in, in, in the fields and they didn't respond, which was brilliant. And then come back in and, you know, uh, with CLL, sometimes having energy is like a battery. Uh, I had almost drained the battery and the sleep and the rest you get after the exercise was fantastic. So I think I've probably taken up enough time. Uh, I, shall, I shall close out on that one. John, fantastic start.
you've worn me out already. <laughs> um, I look forward to coming back and chatting about uh, various aspects um, that perhaps you can expand on. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce a great introduce a great friend in uh, Jackie Martin, a, a fellow patient. And Jackie has a, a great wealth of experience in many areas, and I'm sure Jackie will will be able to share some some uh, interesting insights with you at the moment. And and I know that one of Jackie's uh, great uh, areas of championing is 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 knowledge and learning and encouraging patients learning. And I suppose it's timely to introduce you, Jackie, with questions already coming in about. Uh, patients wanting to know how they focus their learning with there being so much information and it all being so overwhelming so not wanting to steer your introduction but may I introduce you Jack and uh, look forward to hearing what you've got to say and chatting later. Thank you Nick remind me about that if I don't if I don't come back to it um, yeah. just a little bit about my own diagnosis first of all I think probably would be appropriate um, I was diagnosed in 2013 and I, to my mind, I was perfectly fit and well. I had absolutely nothing wrong with me except I was covered in bruises. And, uh, and after much nagging, I had a blood test and uh, my platelets were 23. Now, what does that mean? I don't know what that means. Anyway, I find myself shuffled off to a uh, clinic. I went on my own because like most uh, things that had ever been wrong with me, I, I, if I ignored them long enough, they went away, and that was that was all pretty good. So I thought this this platelet rubbish might uh, might all be the same. Um, I was very quickly dissuaded uh, that it, it wasn't something I could ignore and and everything. And in fact, um, I was straight in and had a, a bone marrow test, which um, was you know one of those things really I suppose I didn't have time to think about it or anything else it was explained to me why I needed uh, a bone marrow test when most uh, CLL patients didn't didn't have it um, it was suggested that um, I have some steroids to uh, try and bring my platelet count up fairly quickly as it was really quite low uh, which I uh, it, probably foolishly at the time but I refused the only piece of advice I did take at that time was uh, not to ride my motorbike because I was told, well, if you come off, then we probably won't be able to get you into theatre. So that was really the saddest bit. It was the end of my motorbiking career for quite, quite a long time. And um, Chris Fagan talked about developing a relationship with the consultant. Uh, our relationship developed fairly quickly because I was going twice a week to have my uh, to have my blood tests done to make see what ha was happening with my platelet count. It didn't go down any lower. And over the next four weeks, it slowly, slowly crept up and uh, and eventually returned to, you know, what, what is apparently normal levels. I actually only had one day off sick. I went back to work thinking, well, I'm uh, probably safer at work, actually. If I'm going to have a, a bleed, then uh, probably better at work than when I'm at home on my own. Um, and to be honest, I did my best to ignore this wretched diagnosis. I didn't really tell anybody. I carried on as much as normal, except for the motorbike stuff. Um, but I was terrified inside. And... It came out in um, horrible, nightmare dreams. And I thought, well, OK, can't ignore it. Let, let's, let's really find out about this, this thing. And, um, and as I learned, I calmed down, became accepting, and I suppose found some peace with it and, um, and really just carried on with my life. I decided that I was going to spend whatever wash and wait time I got um, addressing my fitness and eating habits and things. Never a big drinker, but uh, definitely eating wasn't great. Um, and and I did, and, I, and I, I was very fortunate. I never felt tired. I didn't get infection. You know, really such a lucky, lucky patient. Um, I did um, join an online community and learnt a lot and, uh, you know, since then try to help other people in, in online communities as well. I really am passionate that people learn 
really as much as they want to, uh, but that they've got the right information and that even if it only, it doesn't necessarily steer them or direct them, but enables them to have a more informed conversation with their doctor so that it becomes more of a partnership and, um, and, and so that they're not so scared really. That's, that's it, that's me. Thanks, Jack. Well, do you know what? After all the years I've known you, I never knew you were a biker. Yeah, oh, there you go. You no, see. That, that explains a lot. <laughs> I, used to have a fire aid. I used to do a lot of voluntary work with the police, trying to um, stop people killing themselves on the on the road. I used to train people in advanced motorcycle skills, and um, some of the best years of my life were spent razzing around the Welsh countryside on uh, on a fire blade. Well, there you go. Um, <laughs> But we, we, we've got um, a great foundation to, to lead forward. I think I'm, I'm going to touch on a few sort of questions early on in, in the journey. And, and I know we've got a mixed audience. We've got many experienced long-termers and we'll have a lot of people that are recently diagnosed. And to be honest, in my, my, my own thinking of CLL, I call recently diagnosed within the, within the first two years because as a person myself, I didn't feel um you know totally comfortable uh, with, with everything until until after the two-year period so I'm, I'm going to direct a question really to prof fagan first really um you know when you receive a diagnosis of chronic lymphocytic leukemia and leukemia the whole batch of information you're given seems a little bit counterintuitive you know how 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 you uh you know th there's an element of inaction and it's a very frightening names in terms of chronic and, and leukemia. Um, and I'm just wondering if you've got any strategies that you can share um, that help patients understand what a, meaning, what a diagnosis of chronic lymphocytic leukemia actually means and um, how to find the information that's relevant to them with regards to their CLL to help them best cope with that. Is that too much of a question to, to ask Chris? Thoughts yes, on far it? Too much. But it's uh, no surprise, Nick, being you. I mean, <laughs> the, the, real, the real difficult thing, and patients struggle with this, that a lot of the data is based on herds of patients. What happens to a 1,000 patients uh, rather than individually to you as a person? And there's a lot of concern about prognostic markers and what do they mean, especially at diagnosis. If you're a stage A patient, uh, and you would normally be on watching weight. What does a high beta 2M mean for you? What does a short lymphocyte doubling time mean to you? And it's very difficult to get that balance right. But we're using the terminology uh, with the patients. If they haven't read the literature, don't really understand that we think we're talking to people who understand a bit. And as Jackie and John have said, patients very enormity. Some want to know absolutely everything and some want to know absolutely nothing. Uh, they were almost angry that they were ever told. They're angry they had the blood test, especially if you happen to be one of those patients where the doctor turns around and forty says things that this is nothing to worry about. You know, it's a bit like finding one of your children's getting divorced. Of course, you worry as a parent. You know, it shouldn't be anything to worry about. They're grown ups, but you know, it's a nature to worry. Once you use terminology like that, everyone is impacted by it, and therefore. Patients get het up with information. Not every centre does the same prognostic test. Not every centre does any prognostic test. It's very highly, highly variable. And what you're really trying to do is impart to the patient why you are saying what you're saying. Say you're stage A not CLL, that means you your blood is effectively normal apart from this heart count treatment. We have that for 10 years, been stable 10 years, but no one had done a previous blood count, or whether they've had it one month, and in three months' time the white count is shooting up and the hemoglobin is shooting down. So at the very beginning, we're trying to learn about their CLL. Yes, we have a, a box of tools called prognostic markers, but they tell us what would happen to a thousand people, not what will happen to the individual. And I think one of the problems patients struggle with is the doctor doesn't actually always know the answer to the question. 
you know, if you've got cancer, you want someone who gives you a definitive yes or no answer. But actually with CLL, we don't actually know ourselves often what it means for the patients. The easiest patients to manage are those who present with advanced disease, because you know what you're going to do, you know what the treatments are, et cetera, et cetera. And you can then have a conversation about that, of what the treatments are, what the side effects may or may not be, what the outcome is likely to be, et cetera, et cetera. Because then we're in the realms of clinical trial data. We have a really good database. But again, we're talking about the herd. What happens in a clinical trial to these people who got this particular therapy? So one of the difficult things for patients is actually they don't always get a straight answer to a very straight question. That's actually because the doctor doesn't have the straight answer for that individual patient. I can tell you what will happen to the herd, the thousand, 700, well, this will happen in 300, that will happen. But for you as an individual, it's actually very, very difficult uh, to give accurate personalized information. And that's where the relationship, that's where it matters. Some patients actually do like you just to stand there and say, nothing is gonna to happen to you. And if you stay that to a stage A naught CLL patient on watching weight, you will be right 50% of the time, nothing will happen to them. For that 50%, it's wonderful. The doctor told me not to worry, nothing would happen. For that 50% where the disease did actually wake up and change, well, that doctor knows nothing. He told me not to worry. And what's happened now? So getting that relationship is really, really important. And it's had and touched upon. Patients need that information at their own pace, at their own level of understanding. One difficulty we often encounter is the pushy child. The, uh, the patient who's the parent doesn't want to know much at all. And the pushy child has been on the internet, got all this information, fills their head, but make sure next time you ask the doctor about their ZAP70 status and rah, rah, rah. And the patient says, what's my ZAP70 doctor? You say, oh, I haven't done it. Well, well, why not? Well, because it's actually probably irrelevant to you as a patient. So getting that understanding from the patient perspective of actually we're all feeling our way through this together. We're going to learn together about them, their individual illness, because every patient's illness is virtually different to the next patient next to them. And that's why it's a journey holding hands together, going through it. Thank I'll you. stop there, Nick, because- uh, Yeah, I was gonna say that. I thought we were gonna lose you there for a second. You crackled a little bit, but you managed to come back. I suppose following on from that, maybe I could ask, um, you know, get some insights from you, Jackie and John, um, you know, how, how, how you found coping with you know, navigating a new system, the new language, understanding the meaning of these words um, and communicating with your care team. I know it seems a long way away, you know, diagnosis when we've been traveling with disease for so long, but I'm just wondering if you, you've got insights, perhaps you can, you, you can share there, John, Jackie? I suppose at the start, uh, back in 1990, I didn't have a huge amount of information to, to, to be able to rely upon. And that's where the relationship with the, the ward sister uh, what, what was, was, was great. Uh, I, I definitely think that um, be, being able to understand the, the amount you need to know, for me, was critical. You know, I, 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 had, a, I had a very much a, an inquiring because I was, I was only 32 years of age at the time, and I wanted to know why this should have happened to me. And, and there wasn't any answers to that question. It, it was a huge question, you know, what, what have I done wrong? Have I been exposed to something? Uh, so uh, I, once I got the answers to those questions, uh, which sort of relaxed me to the fact that I hadn't done anything wrong. I then turned that sort of mental uh, effort around to a positive mental attitude to say, right, okay, this is what needs to be done. Let's just get on and do it. And uh, I, I think even through the dark times of the variety of treatments I've had, uh, that sort of positive mental, realistic, not just, you know, the world's a rosy place, but a, a realistic, positive mental attitude um in a pragmatic way has has certainly helped me uh but you know getting good quality information from reliable sources 
uh, in the volume that is uh, understand uh, absorbable has 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 worked for me but may not work for everybody thanks john that's really really insightful and helpful jack um jackie i was just wondering um if, if you're able to share obviously um, it seems that we're on a theme of building relationship from either side is is really important but also um, how you manage the level of information. John touched on the fact that there was very little information available 30 years ago, but that's not the case now. And it can, I do myself remember being so overwhelmed with so much complex information. So I'm just wondering, have you, are you able to share in, insights um, and, and uh, how to navigate the new system, understand the language, um, building that relationship with with your with, with with your care team, and most importantly as well, um, how how to focus learning and manage information. Well, I think as I said at the beginning, um, I going twice a week. I've quickly developed quite a, a relationship with my uh, consultant. Bless him. Um, I don't think I was the easiest patient by any means. I used to breeze in. Okay, quick, let go. Okay, let, let go. And he'd be like, no, whoa, 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 slow down. You know, let's, we need, there are things we need to talk about. And, and often it was at the end of the day because I'd, um, I'd go after, not after work, but I'd, I'd leave work an hour early or so and then go around and get it done. Um, he um, spent a lot of time talking to me about CLL, to be honest. He was, really a star because he saw completely past all my yeah whatever it's fine what I'm off sort of thing and um and could see that really what, what I needed was 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 a bit more support than I, than I was you know visually asking for the the booklets were fantastic uh, to be honest they um, had got a glossary in the back which explained or the uh, terminology, I absolutely soaked that up. And once I'd, once I'd become familiar with uh, quite a lot of the terms, we would have, um, you know, bearing in mind this one twice a week for, for four weeks or so, uh, we would have, you know, what I felt were really, really helpful conversations. I felt uh, completely safe with him, really. I could see he had my well-being absolutely at the forefront of his mind and didn't matter what I tried to brush him away he was he was he was definitely there because I looked um then started looking online for stuff and things like that um I was familiar with some terminology I looked at research papers and and started looking up different little bits of of CLL and then started to see how some of it was uh, becoming interconnected and it, I think it was then I realized how complex it was and how different everybody's journey can be um but some people are fortunate you know perhaps never to need treatment mine in in the time that i've been going just that short month to have my platelets monitored you know my count was going up and up and up and although he reassured me well it might come down again i actually never believed that um, and true enough, it never did actually, but you know, it sometimes it didn't go quite as fast as other times. Um, so it, it's, it's a process, isn't it? You start taking little baby steps and you think, okay, right, well, I think I've got that now. And, um, and then you move on to, to other, you know, start with the information leaflets and then move on to other forms of information and support. And, and the doctors that you see, are, are the best because they can put it in what they can put what you've learned or you think you've learned into context for you and as Chris said every patient is different and unique and we don't have all the answers but putting it in concept context can take away some of the uh, fear and anxiety for patients I think that's probably as much as I'd, I'd have to say about it at the moment Thanks, Jack. That's that's really helpful. I'll, I'll ask one more question and then um, hand over to Stephen. I think I'm just following on along the theme where Jack, you mentioned you cracked on on your own and didn't uh, involve other people in your diagnosis. And I recall doing something similar myself. Um, and also remember Chris mentioning in his talk, which I can relate to as well, um, not hearing perhaps half of what the doctor was saying. So um, 
John and and um, Helen, may, maybe you could share um, thoughts about how people can communicate with other people in their families or their friends and how they can involve other people in their diagnosis. Uh, and, and if that would help, because I know that was very much a eureka moment for myself as a patient when I first reached out to a charity was how do I communicate with others and how can I involve them in, in, in um, uh, the diagnosis process. So, uh, John, I don't know if you shared, and apologies if I didn't um, recall everything because we're covering a lot of ground. Have you did did you involve your partner and, and family and others in your diagnosis? And, and have you got thoughts in 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 that area? Yeah, yeah certainly, Nick. Uh, my, my wife was and has been the rock that I have stood on. Uh, as I as I did say, she she was a nurse, so was able to translate the medical stuff to a to 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 a roughy toughy Nazi tiger that I portrayed. Uh, myself as at the time, uh, and, and it was a huge support. Uh, interestingly, from our perspective as well, um, when I was diagnosed, we didn't have kids. We then proceeded to have kids and, you know, we didn't hang about because at some stage the treatment was going to uh, nuke me, so, uh, so we did. And then as life went on and the kids who, who are now uh, both in their 20s, we had various levels of conversation with with the kids as they were growing up. Uh, when I had a stem cell transplant and I I looked the worst I'd ever looked in my life, probably uh, that was a delicate conversation to prepare the kids as to, as to how dad would look. But in all honesty, living with CLL has been the norm for, for the kids. Uh, talking to my parents uh, at the time, my biggest worry was managing my parents rather than uh, be, be, because I, I think that the natural worry that Chris alluded to for for parents and, and as we became parents, we, we had a natural worry about what were the, the, our children. Uh, so, yes, involvement with, with the immediate family was critical and the, the involvement of the remainder of the family uh, was uh, on a, a sort of a, a needs basis in as much as how some of them wanted, had an appetite for information and others just, are you doing okay? Fine, grand, move on. So uh, I'll leave it at that, Nick. Thanks, John. Um, Helen, have you got anything that you'd like to share with regards to, um, you know, patients undergoing diagnosis and how they can involve family and friends and others to help them um, through appointments and the first stages of, of diagnosis? I think it, it's definitely helpful to have someone with you when you're diagnosed and you're getting all that information. You've got another set of ears listening and they can write down notes and, and to take it all in. A common question is, who do I need to tell? Do I need to tell the family member? Do I need to tell the rest of the family? So a lot of patients ask that. When's the right time to say something? So if you're going on to active monitoring, do I need to tell them anything yet? And a lot of patients seem to think that they don't want to be treated any differently. They don't want family members to then wrap them up in cotton wool and treat them any differently because they don't feel any different. So that's their fear is that they want to keep it to themselves because they don't want special treatment or, or people thinking of them in a different way. They want to keep that normality, really. So I think that's that's a, a main question I get from a lot of people, especially younger patients like John was younger. I think they find it even harder to process it and who to tell how to tell their own parents even really that um, what's happening to them. Um, and it takes them a lot longer, I find, to get their head around things and, and to get to a point where they feel comfortable telling people or who they work for and, and, and work colleagues and things like that. Thanks, Helen. Um, I'm, I'm gonna hand over to Stephen um, to explore perhaps, I know it's not sequentially the next thing, but. Um, you know, something that we all get have to get used to as patients, which is active monitoring, watch and wait at different stages of the journey. And, and I didn't allude to it and touch on it, but maybe we can cover that as we go on. You know, part of diagnosis is dealing with the shock and the distress and the anxiety and the fear and the impact of that diagnosis. And a lot of that carries forward into the next stage of your journey. So perhaps I could uh, introduce you all to Stephen and Stephen, perhaps you could uh, discuss watch and wait at the various stages in the patient's journey. 
Yeah, thank you. So yeah, so thanks for all the questions so far. We, obviously, we've been focusing very much on new diagnosis, etc. And sometimes um, you might go into treatment straight away, depending on what you've done. And we're going to cover more about that later as well. But often, not only have you had a new diagnosis, but also your first treatment might be active monitoring or watch and wait. And that's when you've got a cancer diagnosis, you're going through the process of perhaps telling people you've got a diagnosis it's a cancer it's CLL and all of what that brings but nothing's going to happen quite yet as well so that is quite a uh, uh, a challenge to get your head around as well not only have you got to get your head around what your diagnosis is it's also then what the next step is as well so I was going to actually just start with Helen from your kind of CNS experience and point of view how how do you help people kind of not get, get their heads around that as the active monitoring is the best thing for them at this at this time, particularly when they've got you know, cancer diagnosis and everyone else who knows about cancer means, well, you've got to start treatment straight away, et cetera. So how do you address that in those content, uh, in those conversations? It can be difficult. I think a lot of people, I think majority of people you speak, if you get the diagnosis sex um discuss properly at the very beginning it makes it easier to learn accept that actually not treating it straight away is the right thing you they don't feel any different so we know that a majority of people it's picked up by accident so they don't feel unwell it's been picked up by a a, a random blood sample they've had for something else or a pre-op for something that uh, they don't feel any different but it is difficult to try and help people navigate through it's there but i'm not going to do anything about it a lot of people do embrace that and they're like, that's fine. I can just compartmental, can't, can't get my words in. <laughs> they can just push that aside really and then not think about it. So not got to think about treatment, whereas others are, we need to act on it now. I think that first meeting is key that you're saying it's chronic. We can't get rid of it, but we can treat it as and when we need to. That the treatments are there. They're very, very good treatments, but there's no point giving you treatments and exposing you to side effects when you don't need that but those treatments are there later on as and when you need them and that there are a large group of people that may never need those treatments um, and treatments when you do get to that they may be we'd say don't look into treatments too much at the beginning as well because they may have completely changed by the time you get to that point so that we may have another set of treatments that have come along so not to focus too much on what's there now um, as and when until we get to that point really and if we get to that point but uh, it, it can be tricky and it's and it's individual again so there's no set routine that you go through with somebody it's how that individual person processes it some people can get on board with that very very easily and that's fine they can cope with that others it, it's a bit more difficult but I think the key is in the explanation in the first place if you've got that right people can then realize actually we don't need to do anything yet we can monitor it and are, are happy with that point that you're under close observation by your health team who yeah. you've got trust in and you're happy to move on in that way and what they advise. Yeah, thanks and, and as, as you said you know, both leukemia care and lymphoma action have a lot of information and a lot of support services to help you know at new diagnosis at watch and wait and understanding active treatment as well and we've got a series of webinars that we've done and we've actually covered active monitoring in a previous version and partly as well um, future plans for that uh, in this focus on CLL as well. Um, perhaps I come to Jackie um, because actually what would it, what's really come out of some of the conversations today is generally, you know, I think we're all in agreement that informed patients have better outcomes and actually using that time that people are on watch and wait is a good opportunity to really read around the subject, to learn, to, to understand that whole new language. I particularly know that you mentioned about the glossary. Um, people can quickly become experts in the, the, the kind of details of, of CLL and they, I guess they've got that time and space to kind of do that when they're on active monitoring and watch away and be aware of what's coming down the line in terms of treatments. You know, how, what, what's your experience of doing that when, when, when you were diagnosed and on active monitoring, watch and wait and how did you go about it? Uh, well, as I said, I, I started off with the booklets, really. Um, I, I quickly realised from looking online and reading the booklets that, as I said, this is some really complicated illness and what is true for one person wasn't true for another one. 
Um, I joined a couple of online uh, CLL communities and um, although I didn't post a lot, um, I was able to listen and learn from other people's shared experiences and the support that people were getting from each other. I, th I think um, CLL is not something that you can learn about in a, in a week, a month, or, or even maybe a year because it takes such a long time to assimilate that information. Mm -hmm. and, and as I said before, not just not having the information, you, you know, you can learn about as many new treatments and everything um, as you like and, and different, you know, beta 2 microglobulins like uh, Chris Fagan said and mutated or mutated and things. But what does that mean for you? And that's when um, having a little bit of knowledge can help you have a better discussion with, with your own doctor and they can put it into context for you. I do feel... Um, passionately that if people want information then we um as advocates we have an obligation to help people to access that information in a in a sort of timely uh, but also empathetic way as well um not just shove it in front of their face and 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 leave them to get on with it but to but to try and explain support um online communities are a safe space for many CLL patients. We talked about communicating with family and friends and things like that. I actually didn't have parents. I didn't have any siblings. I didn't have a husband, but I did have some a couple of good friends and they were the only people I shared it with. The, the online community can be a place where people want to rant, cry, or, or whatever things that they can't say and can't lay on their on their relatives because it's it feels too raw um and then as um john said you then have to deal with them being upset or or whatever so this you know slow accumulation of knowledge and information over a period of time in that watch and wait period especially I think is extremely valuable and uh, an online communities are very good at fulfilling that, mm. that need. Okay, thanks. Um, and can I, I think- just add in, Stephen? Can, yeah, I just, sure. can I just add, just reading some of the comments about what, one of the problems watch and wait patients have is they almost feel they're being a nuisance to a busy consultant mm -hmm. who looks rushed, behaves rushed, and you get the impression you're just actually being a nuisance to them. What we're talking about here is verbal therapies, uh, actually. And I don't think patients should be embarrassed at all to say to the consultant, I'm ever so sorry, I really don't understand. I just need 10 minutes for you to explain to me I've got these questions. Because everyone, you go there, the doctor says your disease looks stable and you almost switch off. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank God, that means I don't need treatment today or next week or whatever. But actually, there's still other things that need addressing. But dare I say the consultant's probably be thinking thank god they don't need treatment on to the next patient in their own mind so i think the patient does need to feel empowered to actually maybe watch where they are not being a nuisance at all your well-being is everything uh to the the medical and nursing team and as jackie sort of implied the doctor she had understood that behind that bravado was actually a very scared person mm. but the doctor if uh, you may need prompting on this uh, about things so do not be embarrassed about saying I know I don't need treatment but actually what I do need is 10 minutes of your time yeah thanks for that. that's a very good point because obviously we know that um particularly I've been talking about the initial if your initial treatment is going to be active monitoring then it's almost as though you might feel that you're not in the system because you're not going to um, having chemotherapy. And when you're in chemotherapy, there's obviously the roller coat, you're swept into the system and you're kind of spat out the other end, having gone through that process as well. But if, you, if you're not doing that, then it's quite hard to feel that you're actually having treatment. And as you said, even active monitoring is, is treatment. And there are then needs around that as well. And almost people feeling that they're not actually part of the system just because they're not having a physical treatment around that. And, and, and I think reiterating what Chris was saying, that's definitely shouldn't be the case and you shouldn't feel that that's the case either. And you may need support around, around that as, uh, as well. It's not just about the physical support needs, it's also about the emotional support needs. And often 
even more so at that kind of active treatment stage because you're having to come to terms with that as a concept as well as other things as well. So can we kind of briefly touched on that around um, initial treatment, but obviously active monitoring can happen at different stages as, as well. And, and as we've heard from people's experience here, CLL is a, is a journey, it's a, it's a long term where you might have, you might be on periods of treatment and then you might be on periods of, of, of active monitoring and, and waiting. And that kind of fluctuates depending on how it is personally. And perhaps I wanted to kind of just touch on that aspect of it from John's point of view, because you've talked about a number of different treatments that you've gone through or different stages that your uh, CLL has, has, has occurred. But how did you then, Kind of when it got to that period of, of watch and wait, having had some treatment and then being perhaps more um, uh, 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 quieter period of time, how, how did you deal with that aspect of it? And particularly at a young age, I was just going to say we've had a number of people who've talked about being on watch and wait for a long period of time. And obviously people, it's, it's more rare to be diagnosed at a, at a younger age, but then you're kind of living with a CLL for even, even longer. So how have you kind of approached that, all those different uh, times of being on treatment and then not being on treatment? In, in reality, I <clears throat> seem to have, uh, looking back on it, a, a, a cycle, it developed into a cycle whereby I had a period of treatment and depending upon the success of that particular treatment, I then had a period where I was untreated. Uh, and that varied from anywhere between a, a year to uh, the, the longest remission as such I had was after my stem cell transplant, which was in 97 or 98. Uh, I had about four and a half years where I didn't have any treatment. And then uh, as my counts were monitored, the frequency of monitoring started to change as the count started to change and the rate of change. And then it signaled that there would be uh, likely uh, treatment coming up. And it, it allowed me to be able to get my head around what the potential treatment might be. And that's where the discussions with the consultant around the options. And I was always very grateful uh, the fact that I did have options. So uh, in between treatments, I endeavoured to live and, and work a, a normal life uh, within my capacity. Um, because I had, was diagnosed when I was, it meant that I had to change careers. I was lucky enough to get a position within the same company I was working with in, in the office. And then I had to build you know, what was going to be one career path. I then had to try and build another career path. And somebody then later said to me, gosh, you were quite driven. I, I never knew I was driven. I always thought I was laid back. <laughs> uh, but by virtue of having to cope with the challenges of managing CLL, I suppose naturally one became driven. Mm -hmm. uh, so periods of, of technically periods of watch and wait, I actually never had. Mm -hmm. I had periods of treatment, periods where I wasn't treated, yeah. but then I was either ramping off stable and then ramping up to treatment. And the one thing that sort of got my head around all of this was it was like managing the national debt. I was never going to pay off this. I'm never going to be cured. I, I got my head around that at an early stage, but I was always at least up until 2014 in a situation where I could anticipate there would be a treatment available to me. 2014 was different. I was looking at a situation where there wouldn't be a treatment. And then miraculously, a glutamate came. And we wouldn't be having this conversation mm. if I hadn't had uh, uh, access to a glutamate at a specific time. Yeah. Uh, that was lifesaver, without a doubt. No, that's a good point as well. In, in the sense, I think we touched on it earlier, even a number of people have been on watch and wait for a long time. And if you do all your research, then you, know, you, you may not, it's about getting into the habit of continuing to keep up to date with research because things are changing all the time. And there are new treatments being uh, uh, part of clinical trials and then being adopted, etc. So it is evolving. 
And you know, what's one of the positive aspects of working in haematology and, and blood cancer is that there is a lot of innovation and a lot of activity around always looking at the next, at the next stages of treatment, et cetera. Um, okay, I think probably that's uh, uh, time to move on to the next set, which is back to Nick about treatment. Uh, just, just for Nick as well, there's a couple of questions that we've had around obviously treatment and obviously active monitoring and watching weight within COVID as well. People who've been diagnosed just before lockdowns and COVID happening, obviously people in the middle of, of that as well and different experiences there than some of the experiences perhaps Jackie and John have had when there wasn't COVID around as well. And that again, that might be something we can explore a bit more uh, alongside treatments as well. Thanks, Stephen. I think that's right, actually, because <clears throat> with lockdown, for want of a better word, and shielding, that's impacting quite heavily, isn't it, on, on um, living well strategies and, and how to cope with the diagnosis, and especially the health aspects. Um, yeah, I was going to start about talking about treatment, but I realise also one third of the audience are likely never to ever need treatment. And, and the topic we we're going to talk about, which is a new one to me, which is prehabilitation. Yeah? Um, you know, how do you prepare for treatment? So I, I, I'm guessing there's an element of crossover with watch and wait, because part of living on watch and wait is healthy living strategies that inevitably will be preparing you for treatment to be able to cope with that, um, uh, you know, in, in a much better way if, if it, you know, if you're healthy. And, and it also helps with regards to preparing for living with active monitoring and watching and wait. So I suppose really what I'd, maybe Helen in supportive care, you'd probably be the best person first to ask about, you know, a, a patient that's been on watch and wait for some time. And I know what that's like. And I think everybody on the panel and many patients would watch and wait, that phase of watch and wait that, uh, you know, everything's on the up is coming to an end. Um, from a clinical perspective first, how would you advise patients to prepare for, for a treatment? And, and that does also involve an element about making sure that you, the patient's informed as well as prepared from a health point of view of what to expect and how to get their ducks in a row. Um, Helen, could you, could you um, maybe share how you would prepare a patient for treatment? I think when we're preparing someone for treatment we usually usually it's not a quick process it's slow so we we know that they're coming up to treatment over a long period of time so that we can start to prepare the patient quite early on um and start the treatment before they get proper symptoms sometimes really that's one of the beauties of CLL that we can see it. usually we can see it coming over a long period of time we can plan ahead pick the right treatment that's when we do all the extra blood tests that people talk about and you see on people asking about online looking for your mutations in um, P53 and things like that, that's when we would do the extra tests so that we can get the right treatment at the right time. Um, and I think, as you said, it's informed choice as well, because we're in a point now where we've got so much choice of treatments as well, really, for a lot of patients. And actually quite complicated as well, really. I think even as health professionals, it's quite a lot to get your head around what, which treatment we can use when now, because it seems to be evolving all the time. Um, but I think it's key is information. So people are making informed choices. They know what to expect. We can give them all the information they could possibly need as to how the treatment will happen. How will they get it? What, how they may feel. Not the, I think some of the information can be quite scary for some people to process. You give them these information sheets, especially trials where you've got the patient information. It lists every single side effect under the sun, which is really, really scary to read, I think, um, first off. And actually, quite, it needs backup of information that actually you're not going to get all of those. It's just a possibility that um, you may get the odd one, but we can deal with it as and when and that the patient knows what to do if it does happen, that they must contact us. And they know the process of safety netting and they know exactly who to call and when to call them and what to do if anything should happen. So information is key, really, and to start that early on and bring it up to the point where they're having treatment so that they feel comfortable, really. So that they're empowered that they've got all the inf information they need and they know what to ask uh they know who to ask and any problems so they're prepared for whatever the treatment may be and i guess a takeaway from that is um don't be you know don't be frightened to ask for the information you feel you need i was going to be sort of a little bit rhetorical you know look at um patient's perspective and maybe jack i don't know if you could share 
you know, you're, you're treated. Uh, um, were you prepared for treatment? And, and if you have prepared for treatment, did you manage to prepare the right way? Or did you find particular strategies that helped you when it came to be treated that you could share with others? Um, are we, yes, I was prepared for treatment. I was um, still saying, no, 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 <laughs> I'm fine. I'm fine. My white cat was 400, something like that. So no, 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 no. Um, and and the, my consultants answer was well okay fair enough but i think i'd feel happier leaving you a bit longer if we can have a look and see what's going on inside you so i had a ct scan and the results of that really showed that there wasn't you know there was wasn't in any of that so then then we started talking about clinical trials really um and i think that's um that's important for patients to consider it if the opportunity is there for them. Uh, I've spent all this time getting fit and well because I thought I was going to get FCR. Uh, and then all of a sudden there was there was which I really, really didn't want, which was part of my oh no, I'm fine strategy. Um, not that um, I realized there were necessarily too many other treatments available, but that I just didn't particularly want that one. Um, and not for any reason other than um, I just didn't want any really, I suppose. But um, no, so we started talking about clinical trials. And at that time, um, and still actually, is the, the FLARE study, which is for first time treatment for patients. And clinical trials, are, are, you know, I've learned are really, really important uh, because it can give patients access to treatments that they wouldn't otherwise have available to them. Helen was saying about, you know, it's complicated about what sort of treatments you can have at what different stages, whether you're relapsed or whether you're first time treatment. Um, and, uh, and the clinical trial can, um, with the help of your consultant, can cut through all that. And he can say, you know, if you're agreeable, I think this might be a good one for your particular situation, your particular CNL. So um, because it was a clinical trial as well as a sort of quite a longer phase running into treatment, you have lots of different tests done and this and that and the other. And then they say, yeah, 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 we'll let you in to our little club and uh, and we'll we'll randomize your treatment. Um, and I remember sitting there the, the day that I was um, I was going to be told which treatment it was. And, and and really trying to convince myself actually it didn't really matter didn't really matter and um, and at that time there was only a choice between a choice a randomization between rituximab uh, ibrutinib or fcr and um, and i i was extremely lucky because i i, I my disease is is uh, 11q and i get bulky nodes and things like that i was very lucky to be allocated ibrutinib um, which, to be honest, Arbutinib and Rituximab, to be honest, it was, was an absolute breeze. I mean, no, I spent a bit of time in the chair having the Rituximab, but again, I could just convince myself, really, there was absolutely nothing wrong with me except this silly, silly leukemia that I was now being dealt with. Thank you very much. And um, yeah, so, uh, so I, it, the, the conversations beforehand, as Helen says, are absolutely key. You need to be properly informed um, about the choices available to you because it is a partnership. And if you've learned a bit beforehand, you can have a proper good discussion with your doctor about what, what's suitable for you. And, and I was very fortunate. I was at a good center and, uh, and I had a good relationship. I, I got the perfect treatment for me really at that time. Thanks, Jackie. Um... Uh, you actually covered a, a, the broader, broad topic there. That would, uh, it, it, a difficult point of view is learning when you should maybe pay a little bit more attention to, to, to what treatment's available and what landscape there is. But as Helen, you know, you should be flagged that at the right point in your journey. So we were talking earlier about not getting bogged down learning too much about um, different treatments and, and the pros and cons of different treatments. But at the right time, that's important information. I guess the next question just leads on to sort of Preparing yourselves for the treatment itself, the side effects you're likely to experience, um, managing the different treatments, and that they all come with different box of frogs now, don't they? And you know, you've got um, uh, you know FCR that you mentioned, uh, or, or um, you know chlorambucil with a benetuzumab, that are, uh, are chemotherapy-based treatments that come with different set of side effects to continuous therapies. 
Um, so I'm just wondering, I don't know if you're the right person to ask, John, but I'm only asking you this question because I know you've had a varied treatment journey. Um, you know, did, did you have a method where, you know, how you prepared to, to and, and how you managed the different side effects that you experienced with your treatments, your different treatments? Or did you have a, a plain sailing, a clear, you know, a, 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 you know, a, a treat, a side effect, relatively side effect free journey? I don't know if that's the right question, John. Have you got anything? Yeah, I, I, um, <clears throat> I, I suppose that there's, there's two boxes to, to to pick from. One is the, the chemotherapy based treatments and how you how I prepare for those, and then there's continuous, like the ibuprofenos, the the venetic vaccines. And uh, in the in the former, uh, I did uh, endeavour to to ask the question, you know, what can I do to put myself in the best position so that I am prepared as well as I can be. Uh, I, I always had a reasonably healthy lifestyle. I certainly didn't become an evangelical health freak when it came to preparing for, because that would just get inside my head. But at the same time, I wasn't cavalier about it. I didn't, uh, uh, I, I didn't take it for granted. The one thing I did certainly learn through the chemo-based treatments was uh, not to tolerate sickness. Uh, you know, anti-emetics, anti-sickness drugs, uh, some of them worked brilliantly, some of them didn't suit me. And I, I probably uh, by accident learned that there were alternatives. So if one particular drug wasn't working for me, then do not hesitate to say that that is the case, because if, if, if you're not keeping it down, and yes, I've talked to God on the, the great white telephone more than a few occasions, uh, then, you know, it's not doing you any good. Uh, so therefore, getting your anti-emetics right is, is critical. And, and even to the point, once I had a whole array of pills in front of me, and the very act of putting my hand out to take the first one almost made me and, and I basically had to take myself aside and have a conversation with myself and say, look, this is going to make you better. Don't worry about the fact you might be a bit, you know, uh, not feeling too well for a while, but this is going to make you better. And, and it was it was getting the head to direct the your internal uh, self, really, what worked for me in terms of. Uh, the, this this coping with treatment coming up, I think to to get yourself in a situation if you're still working that you inform work what the consequences may be. Uh, I know when I tried to work through all of the treatments I could. Obviously, with stem cell transplant, you can't. I was out for uh, three four months at the time. Uh, but uh, in, in other uh, treatments I had, I tried to work all the way through it. Uh, yeah, the team had to step up and, and, and take up the slack. And, and at times I was like the proverbial bear with the sore behind. Uh, I, I know that. And, and that was brilliant that, that both family and you know, work colleagues, uh, you know, tiptoed around that. And, uh, but, you know, the, it, it's, it's very much self-driven, I think, as to how you, how you prepare. Uh, and like probably what we've heard a lot today, uh, there's a, whilst there's a, there's a generic uh, approach to all of this, it's very much down to the person. Thank you, John, for sharing that. And I think um, what comes out of that also is, um, you know, it, it, ensuring that you, uh, communicate with your care team, especially supportive care, Helen's department, um, with how to manage side effects and sudden onset of, you know, so that you've got somebody to reach out to there. I'm just going to throw one last question in this area because I'm mindful of time and, and want to hand back to Stephen to maybe look at a little bit more depth about treatment and others. But uh, one question has come up about managing side effects and maybe I could throw this to you, Chris, um, a question with regards to, you know, uh, um, sort of mouth infections, ulcers and fungal infections, you know, these are common sites, you know, I think um, a few of us can testify to this, but could you explain about these types of infection and experiences and how to manage these? So the most common type of infections one get, fungal infections in mouth, usually candida based, especially with people who've had steroids uh, for it. They're very easily managed. There's lots of antifungals out there. Uh, to try oral ones, uh, which have very, virtually no toxicity and are really, really effective. 
viral infections, recurrent herpes, for example, the immune system can be low with CLL and can be knocked even lower with the various therapies. However, prophylactic acyclovir or valacyclovir is a very, very effective treatment for herpes-related problems. And again, it's just a matter of do not suffer in silence. Um, you know, when I was a lad, we were all taught to look in the mouth, et cetera, every time before you gave chemotherapy. That was many years ago. We probably got a bit blasé because a lot of treatments now for CLL aren't chemotherapy like we used to remember it. But certainly venetoclax and abrutinib could cause neutropenia, ascobinituzumab. So if you have got uh, a sore mouth uh, and you have got symptoms, bring it to the attention of your medical team. Because there's almost certainly a treatment you can have out there, not just for the acute situation, but it's prophylaxis to stop it coming back. And you should continue that right through to the end of your treatment, usually a bit beyond, and then you try stopping it and see whether the problem recurs or not. Thanks, Chris. That, that ties in nicely with what John was saying there about making sure you take your antiemetics and all of your tablets to help these help help deal with these side effects. Perhaps, Stephen, I could hand it back over to yourself now, maybe to cover a last set of questions to look at treatment and managing treatment, how to best cope with treatment. Um, yeah, we, thanks. We covered it. And there's a couple of questions, and perhaps we haven't got enough time to go through in more detail. But again, just going back to Jackie, because you mentioned about the FLARE trial and there's been a couple of questions of people who are on the FLARE trial and coming to the end of their uh, period on it and what's happening next. I know this is something that has been uh, there's been lots of discussion in the background around it. And perhaps rather than go into too much detail now, um, just kind of comment on where people can find the, uh, the most recent up to date information as to what's happening and what the options are next. Because I know that both Lymphoma Action and Leukemia Care and CLL Support have put out information about that. Is that right? Are you asking me, Steve? Yes, yeah, just to kind of comment on that, because you mentioned the FLARE trial particularly. Okay. So um, my understanding is that patients on the FLARE trial, um, if, if you're having one of the novel, uh, if you're having ibrutinib, is that that will come to an end at six years. However, um, that doesn't mean patients are being abandoned, um, uh, you know, and, and, and set adrift with no support and no uh, no aftercare, quite the contrary, the monitoring will continue, but there will also be a new clinical trial for those patients to enter and there will be options to continue your ibrutinib or there'll be an option to be randomized between stopping ibrutinib and having very careful monitoring of your uh, CLL or the other, the other half of the randomization is to continue ibrutinib. So there's an option to choose to continue, or there's an option to go into the trial where you may be randomized between stopping and continuing. And as I said, it, whichever way it is, you, 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 the monitoring will continue and you will still be well looked after. But it's an opportunity to see if those patients who've been on ibrutinib for six years and will have that in that time achieved really deep remissions, um, if you can safely take them off the drug and give them a, 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 a rest period, if you like, um, and then treat them again if and when it comes back and treat them again at an early stage, not waiting until they fulfill other criteria for treatment. That's my understanding. And, and I think that information is going out uh, very shortly to uh, to people's doctors. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, so just obviously we touched on treatments and there's different types of treatments and different lengths of time of treatment. Some are, are, as John was saying, kind of a chemotherapy treatment, a number of cycles. Others are more kind of over a period of time, something that you might take um, uh, regularly over two, two years or even beyond that. And so it's interesting how all of that is, is changing. Perhaps kind of Helen, um, you could add around, are there things that people can do when they're on treatment, perhaps around diet and around exercise to help kind of can keep as well as they can and as perhaps as prepared and as, as fit as they can while they're going through treatment as, as well? And, and perhaps people are thinking, well, I shouldn't do anything like exercise or while I'm on treatment because that might have a, a negative effect or whatever. But what do you, how do you support people and, and what kind of tips and tricks are there to kind of get the best out of the treatment physically and, and mentally as well? Um, 
I think we say even from diagnosis, a normal, healthy diet, healthy lifestyle, exercise as much as you can tolerate, really, as much as you want to do. I think when people are at start on treatment, I think mentally even just to try and keep a bit of normality to life as well as much as possible seems to be a more positive effect for patients that it doesn't life doesn't revolve around their treatment they need some normality there to be able to get on with life as well uh, and to look after themselves mentally um which i think can be difficult i think with the treatments there are some that you're on for as long as they're working and i think at the beginning we were worried about people being um following that and remembering to take tablets but i think we're now finding the other way that when you stop after two years Patients are actually quite worried about that. They've had this drug that they feel very safe taking. They've taken it every day. They've taken it religiously. And now it's going to stop. And what will happen next? So I think all the treatments are so different at the moment with CLL. So the venetoclax rituximab, the venetoclax stops after two years and things. And we're just getting to the point now where those patients are stopping. They've been on it two years. We're just seeing that now. So, And it is a concern for some patients. They find it a real worry. Um, and I think it's trying to help people realize that life carries on <laughs> as normal and if they're you're closely monitored and if there are any problems and we even restart venetoclax at that point if need be you can be reintroduced um so i think i think more than anything mental health is more important at the moment as well especially with everything that's happening in the world that uh, to look after your mental health has a big impact on your physical health as well really and how you deal with things and cope with treatments but if you can have a good general lifestyle that's healthy is the best starting point you can ever have really and that you don't need to stay in bed and while you're having treatment and things like that that actually you can exercise as much as you can don't overdo it and then completely fool yourself for the rest of the week but little and often really and whatever you feel you can and even with fatigue we know that exercise can be something that, that can help with um effects of fatigue so we know that a lot of people with CLL fatigue is their main thing so when I see people in clinic it's always I'm just so tired but mm. we know that um, I know leukemia care and things they all offer fatigue um, classes and things so ways of dealing with it the exercises seem to be a really helpful thing that can yeah. help. We actually did a, a webinar on that a couple of weeks months ago now which was uh, focusing on fatigue and strategies and tips and techniques for managing fatigue because as you said not you know across a lot of cancers and, and particularly amount of blood cancer and lymphoma and leukemia chronic fatigue is one of the biggest side effects of treatment or just one of the challenges of even coming off treatment and and getting back to feeling more of a, a normal quality of life. And perhaps, Chris, you can kind of add anything there, particularly as obviously you're involved in a lot of kind of trials and, and, and treatments that are now uh, more available. But also, I appreciate you've recently retired, but I'm sure you kind of keep still keeping an eye on what's what's developing. And, and what's your kind of view as to the landscape of how treatments are, are, are changing and developing and what's kind of coming down the track, as it were? Just to go sort of at the, at the start of why are some treatments continuous and why are some uh, fixed duration? And that is basically based on the initial trial from which the company got a license indication for it. And we're only meant to use the drugs in the way the license says you can. That's nearly always based on a trial. So if you just take, for example, you have a, a very effective drug like a Brutinib, uh, it's all or not much toxicity. It absolutely transformed the landscape. If I was an investor in that drug company, I want the patient to take it forever. Because that way my company gets paid forever. So the truth of the matter is that there was never a study run by the company to see whether you could stop Ibrutib or not. And we've actually been here before with the sister disease, chronic myeloid leukemia, with a drug called imatinib, which absolutely transformed uh, chronic myeloid leukemia. Um, we now have methods to detect one leukemia cell in 100,000 normal cells. So you know how much disease the patient has got on board. And in chronic myeloid leukemia, they did a study whereby if you stopped the imatinib uh, over a three to five year period, in only half the patients did the disease actually wake up. But again, with imatinib, the company didn't do that study at the beginning. That was later followed on by clinicians once we got an effective therapy. Again, the venetoclax two-year duration, that's what they did in their clinical trial. So that's what we followed. No one did the study that 
is two years right? Is six months enough? Is 12 months enough? Or do you need three years? So it's not unusual to have to go and do further trials. But basically, people do get worried. They get, I'm feeling so well, the drug has worked so well. But drugs do have toxicities that may be cumulative, and especially in the case of a brutinib, we've appreciated a lot more uh, hypertension and atrial fibrillation, for example. It isn't quite like Smarties, whereby you get all the benefit and it's all joy and there is no potential toxicity. So in that sense, uh, further trials are inevitable. We are moving into the, the, to the non-chemotherapy era. And I think between venetoclax, ibrutinib, acalabrutinib, and, and similar drugs to come, and new antibodies such as binituzumab, we will have a way of treating CLL very, very, very successfully, getting deep and deep responses, more than we've ever achieved before, uh, going forward. So I think the future treatment-wise is going to be very, very different. They are phenomenally more effective than chemotherapy actually was. And chemotherapy, as John has shown, can be very, very effective as well. It's getting the right treatment for the right patient and using that treatment correctly. And we're all learning how to use the treatment ourselves. Thanks. I think, Nick, that's our kind of few minutes more warning. Perhaps I'll have back to you. Well, yeah, I think I just saw up. that, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I suppose... Could I just hand a, 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 a just a, a finishing phrase to maybe a, a, literally a sentence from everybody? If you could choose one message to give people as to how to live well with their CLL, Jackie, John, as patients, could you perhaps share anything? Do you have one message that you would share? And then, uh, then I'll uh, run through uh, the closing slides. I, I would say you're still the same person. Um, that this is a marathon and not a sprint, that you, the treatments are so effective that, you know, go and live your life um, and, and, and try not to worry about it. Let the doctor do the worrying and you, you live your life. John. Muted. I would say that uh, do your best to remain infection free. You're in the best position then to be able to accept treatment. Uh, life with CLL is a new normal. It's a phrase we've just become accustomed to. But, you know, us CLL people have lived with a new normal since our diagnosis. And we just, we just get on with it. Thank you both. And thank you, everybody, for being so candid and sharing some really valuable information. And we could talk on this topic for a long time. Um, I'd like to just share with everybody that, you know, one thing that came up in discussion, there's now a lot more information, a lot more supportive resource available for patients to help with different stages of your journey and, to, and your learning. Um, Leukemia Care and uh, Lymphoma Action, along with other charities, uh, there's, there's quite a library now available of webinars. Um, one thing, CLL patients, as a patient myself, we've all learned through the years, you don't go to one source of information, you'll dip and, uh, you know, to taste the snorkers board of different uh, opportunities. So, uh, you know, please, you can subscribe to newsletters, our magazines, podcasts, social media, and the websites. And, uh, you know, as I was alluded to in, uh, I noticed some of the discussions, you know, people asking what uh, patient groups, you know, um, should you subscribe to? There are several options there in Facebook groups with Lymphoma Action, Leukemia Care, there's the Health Unlocked group. There are other blood cancer charities who, who have the, the, the online support groups. Quite often it's going to be you finding what information fits your personality. Um, just, just to give you a heads up, um, coming in the next month, um, Leukemia Care and Lymphoma Action will be organising another Living Well uh, an uh, initiative web uh, webinar and we will be concentrating very much on the watch and wait the active monitoring aspect of living with the condition hence why we didn't go into too much detail on that today um, next slide please um, I think it's important to look at support services um, you know it's it's phenomenal I mean I'm a long-time patient and certainly not as long-term and as experienced as John but I remember when diagnosed, um, you know, 12, 13 years ago, how little information was available then. And it's, you know, it's incredible what is available now. So, again, you, you can pick up what fits you, you know, the, the helpline and WhatsApp live chat, uh, the virtual support groups and um, Lymphoma Action and Leukemia Care now have, uh, you know, quite, quite a, a, an inventory of uh, 
virtual support groups across the country and, and COVID has helped expand that. So they're available on your fingertips. Welfare advice is really important to everybody at the moment in COVID. So don't be frightened to have a look there. There are dedicated advocates available for you there within advocacy support and you know, take part in self-management uh, self, uh, workshops, touched on online forums, buddy schemes. And I'll finish off with the counselling fund because we didn't really touch a lot on that today. Um, you know, living with CLL is a burden on you both emotionally and psychologically at all times of your journey. It can't be avoided. You know, a lot of a diagnosis, it doesn't go away. We all know this. It's always sitting on your shoulder at some point during your watch and wait journeys and in between treatments. So, you know, please reach out if you want to discuss something, especially now when everybody's feeling so isolated that there are counselling funds available. The Leukaemia Care Counselling fund, fund is available there for, for, for you to be able to connect with counsellors if you feel the need. Um, and just to finish off, here are our contact details. And of course, most importantly, I want to thank everybody for giving your time. And special thank yous to Professor Chris Fagan. And it's such a shame that he has to retire. He's always been there for us. And I hope you will, Chris, still be there for us in the future. Um, and may I just thank everybody um, for a really helpful webinar. And, and may you all live well with CLL. And we finished with John on the screen. What an excellent um, ad ad advertisement, 30 years into CLL and, well, you don't look as if you've had it for long, John. Uh, did you have hair then? <laughs> well, excellent. Goodbye, everybody. And uh, Stephen, thank you so much for um, your experience and yeah. in, in, in helping co-host. My pleasure. Take care, everyone. Yeah. Bye, Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.